Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us for what I anticipate will be a very inspiring lecture by Dr. William Miller, who I think brought with him to our lovely city the weather from the southwest. It's we've got a beautiful summer evening, finally. I'm Tina Zupnicki. I'm deputy dean for the curriculum and also a faculty member here at the School of Social Service Administration. I welcome you on behalf of Dean Neil Guterman, who sends his regrets as he's currently out of the country. I think he's in Uganda right now. I know he joins me in thanking you for your attendance today. I'd especially like to welcome SSA students, alumni, faculty, lecturers, staff, field instructors, and all of our colleagues from the field of social work. In tonight's lecture, you'll hear from our distinguished speaker about the potential for personal transformation. We also want to acknowledge your collective work, counseling clients, supervising students, directing programs, and advocating for improved social welfare policies. Your efforts have the potential to change some of our most intractable problems of our day. This evening's lecture is made possible by the Ruth Knee Fund for Spirituality and Social Work. Named in honor of SSA graduate Ruth Ireland Knee, it provides an opportunity to explore the diverse ways spiritual and religious traditions are experienced in clinical social work practice. Ruth was a pioneer in social work and community me mental health in the United States, joining the Public Health Service as one of its first psychiatric social workers. A founding member of the National Association of Social Workers, she chaired the Committee on the Study of Competence, which was instrumental in setting standards for social work practice. Over a period of 30 years, Ruth Nee developed social work roles within public health and military health care programs and advanced innovations and improvements in mental health services at the federal level. She also served as one of SSA's luminary volunteers, sponsoring Washington Week, the student career services program designed for, to help SSA students learn about career options in social policy and government. Among her many accomplishments and honor, in 2001 she was given the Edith Abbott Award, honoring lifetime achievement. It is a privilege for us to honor Ruth's legacy through this biannual lecture. On behalf of the school, I would like to thank the sponsors who helped make tonight and tomorrow's advanced motivational interviewing workshop possible. The Center for Health Administration Studies, particularly Jean Marsh, Colleen Grogan, and Harold Pollack. The Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation in Sexual and Reproductive Health, or CI3, most especially Amy Whitaker and Melissa Gilliam, and Heartland Alliance, particularly Karen Batia, Joan Leoto, and Reverend Sid Moan. I'd also like to acknowledge the tremendous assistance of SSA alum Scott Peterson, who proposed the idea of offering an advanced motivational interviewing workshop, which he will co-lead tomorrow with Dr. Miller. A brief housekeeping item. Please return your evaluation at the conclusion of tonight's event at the registration table. If you are receiving CEUs for your attendance, please remember to sign out and pick up your certificate before leaving. Now I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleague and central figure in arranging Dr. Miller's visit to SSA, Professor Summerson Carr. In 1959, C.P. Snow famously identified two cultures, that of science and that of the humanities. He charged that these cultures had become so bounded, so circumscribed in their intellectual concerns, so orthodox in their epistemological commitments and methods of engagement, that even his most learned colleagues could not find a way to communicate across them. Gone were the days of scholars like William James, who began his career at Harvard as an anatomist and physiologist and spent the next 40 years teaching and writing fluidly between physiology, philosophy, and psychology, wielding tremendous influence in the US and Europe, in part because of the beauty and accessibility of his writing. 
Yet even James, in the opening lines of his University of Edinburgh lectures that were later to become the varieties of religious experience, admits some trepidation in approaching the question of mystical experience by way of psychology and neurology, not only because the science of the day failed to consider religious experience a properly scientific subject, but also because there were those who wanted to protect the realm of the sublime from systematic inquiry. If the results of James' efforts are now widely appreciated of still the subject of hearty critique, consider that James' work is now far more likely to be taught in an English department alongside his brother's novels than in a department of psychology or a school of social work. Of course, this is now also the case with the work of Sigmund Freud, Arguably one of the very few things that Freud's and James' work has in common is that it's considered insufficiently scientific to be seriously engaged by many academic psych psychologists and clinical social work scholars today. Yes, indeed, there are still two cultures, but William R. Miller is an intrepid traveler between them. He is also a gifted translator whose work, who works between the well uh, fortified borders of scientific and humanistic inquiry, and, do, and in doing so offers us new ideas about how we might enrich intellectual life, and especially our, uh, the, our understandings of the processes of human change. As one of the world's most cited scientists, author of 40 books, uh, over 40 books and 400 articles, many of which are devoted to the development, testing, and dissemination of behavioral treatments for addiction, William Miller has also written extensively about integrating spirituality into treatment, Judeo-Christian perspectives on psychology, and positive faith or living as if. He has also followed James in his interest in mystical experience, devoting particular attention to what he calls quantum change. It is not just across his voluminous writings, but also within his best known work on motivational interviewing that one finds a happy marriage of humanistic and scientific thinking. Bill has devoted himself to specifying and evaluating techniques of therapeutic engagement with a close eye on fidelity and the measurement of MI's effects at the very same time that he has uh, proffered that there is a spirit to MI, which unites its veterans practitioners uh, uh, and it speaks to MI's ever-expanding expan client population. In MI, we find an evidence-based evidence -based practice which is endowed not only with a set of highly specifiable skills for producing change, but also with the quasi-mystical proposition that radical change can and sometimes does emerge out of the most mysterious reaches of human experience and interaction. We are lucky today to hear his first public talk between his very well-known work on MI and his lesser known work on quantum change, lesser known perhaps precisely because the boundaries of what counts in the study of human experience are drawn too strictly by many of us in the scholarly community. So it's with great anticipation and without further ado that I introduce Dr. William R. Miller, who will speak to us today about motivational interviewing and quantum change, reflections on human potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in Chicago, uh, especially with weather like this. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two lines of research, one, that, one that's gone on for almost 40 years at this point and another that maybe is 15 years old. And, and I hope to do that in an hour, so that's about a minute a year. Uh, in, uh, I'll be moving over a lot of terrain. But those two lines of research have to do with motivational interviewing and with, uh, and with quantum change that initially I thought did not have much in common, but I'm beginning to think that they do. So first I'll tell you the story about motivational interviewing uh, that did not start from a theory, did not, was not pre-planned, uh, but just sort of emerged over time in an, an atheoretical uh, and accidental kind of way and wound up taking over my life. Um, I guess a beginning was in Milwaukee where I was on internship at the Veterans Hospital there. Uh, and I was invited to spend the summer on an alcoholism unit. And the director of the unit said, what do you know about alcoholism? I said, nothing really. 
well, what did they tell you in graduate school? I said, well, I actually don't remember it coming up. Uh, he said, well, then you better come and spend the summer with us because this is the second most common diagnosis you will see throughout your lifetime. Uh, and so I did spend the summer there and it opened up my, uh, one of my primary areas of love and interest in clinical work. Uh, and since I didn't know anything about alcoholism, I simply put on my best Carl Rogers hat, happily I'd been trained in Rogers as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and just listened to the patients and asked them to tell me how they'd come to be where they were and what their thoughts were about their future and uh, what they cared about. And I just listened with the best reflective listening that I could uh, muster. And the patients seemed to really enjoy it, and I really enjoyed it. I learned a tremendous amount uh, from them. And then I began reading literature on alcoholism, which I'd not read before, and it said alcoholics are pathological liars, have immense levels of immature defenses and denial. They're out of touch with reality, very difficult to communicate with. Uh, and I thought, gee, those aren't the people I was talking to. Maybe they're different in Milwaukee. I don't, uh, I don't know. <laughs> But it, it was a beginning hint that there was something in the addiction field that needed a bit of attention. Well, I, I, I was inspired to uh, do my dissertation on uh, treatment of alcohol problems. And uh, in a subsequent study, one of the puzzles was, why did the control group get better? Hmm? In this particular study, uh, we compared two different conditions both of which were cognitive behavioral, basically. One of them was a counselor delivered behavior therapy for about 10 weeks. And one of them, we, which was our no treatment control, we sent people home with a self-help book that described the same kinds of methods and said, you know, read the book, work with this, and see how you can do with these things, and we'll see you in 10 weeks and see how you're doing. And both, both groups kept a, a weekly record, a weekly diary of their drinking. Uh, that, that book eventually became what, what is now called uh, Controlling Your Drinking. It's still in print after all this time. Well, what we found was that the two groups did not differ at all in their outcomes. The uh, yellow group is the decline in drinks per week in people who are seeing a counselor. It looks good. You'd be happy with those outcomes. And the red line is people working on their own with a self-help book, and they look like they're doing just as well as people who were being seen by a counselor. And that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, according to my training. According to my training, the more time you spend with a therapist, the better you get. You know? But these people had the gall to go home and, and, <laughs> and read a book and get better. You know? So I, I moved to Albuquerque and thought the finding would go away. <laughs> I repeated the study with those two groups in it and replicated the finding in 1978 in 1979, in 1980. Talk about being in denial, yes. <laughs> and I finally decided that there maybe there's a phenomenon here that needs to be understood. So what was going on? How come people were getting better in this kind of self-directed uh, condition? Well, maybe it was just an artifact of time. Maybe once people walk through the door of the clinic, they're better. I mean, they've made the decision to come to a clinic and you can stand on your head or do anything and they're going to get better after that. So that's a possibility. We also asked people in these groups, what, what really helped you? And they said, keeping those records really helped me a lot. That when I wrote down every drink like you told us, uh, before I had the drink, I'd get out my card and say, mm -mm, maybe I've had enough. And, uh, so that made me really aware. So we thought maybe it's a reactive effect of self-monitoring. And so we designed the study to control for those things. And in this particular study, uh, we had the first, the uh, two usual conditions of seeing a counselor for 10 weeks, going home with a self-help book, going onto a waiting list and keeping a diary, or going onto a waiting list and not keeping a diary. Right. Well, what we found was that the yellow group again improved rather well. The red group working on their own with the self-help book started off worse and wound up better uh, relative to the uh, counselor group. And statistically, they were pretty similar to each other. At 15 month follow-up, they're just, you know, just the same again. So we have just as much improvement in the self-help group as in the counselor group, as we'd found in four previous randomized clinical trials. 
On the green line, the waiting list group uh, didn't change at all. And then when we treated them, with or without the diary, by the way, it didn't, it didn't matter if they kept the diary. Actually, people keeping a diary, the drinking went up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but combining the control groups, they didn't change at all. Then we treat, they came in and saw a counselor, and their drinking went down uh, and looked just about as good as the other groups, although it splashes back a little bit. So, so it wasn't just the passage of time, and it wasn't just keeping diary records. It was something else. Well, although that finding was surprising to me, there are now dozens of trials showing that even a relatively brief intervention with people who are drinking too much can trigger a change. Uh, and in another paper that I wrote, there are certain characteristics of interventions that seem to work well uh, in helping to trigger that change in a single conversation. Uh, again, that was different from my training. It shouldn't be that you can have a single conversation with somebody that's been practicing a pathological behavior for 15 years and they turn the corner, you know? and yet there it was, uh, over and over in the literature. And I began to thinking about that control group because actually if, if you do follow people over time, once they've identified themselves as having a problem, they do tend to decrease in, in problem behavior. And yet these folks didn't change at all. They're absolutely flat. And it occurred to me they did what we told them to do. They waited. They were politely waiting for us to give them permission to change. We, and what are you saying to someone when you put them on a waiting list? You're not expected to get better until we can treat you. And then we can, so go ahead and drink. And, and then we'll treat you and then you'll get better. And so very obedient patients did what we, uh, what we suggested that they ought to do. And it kind of got my attention in terms of how much influence we can have just by almost our subconscious communications with, with patients. I also began to notice that therapists have very different outcomes. And in every study in addiction treatment where that's been studied, it's true. Uh, different therapists doing the same treatment with the same manual, with the same supervision process, with the same content, allegedly, have very different outcomes. And we were seeing the same thing. In the study we did quite a while ago, as, as you can see, We had nine counselors and three supervisors, including myself. And we watched those counselors working through via one-way mirrors. That's how long ago this was. Um, couldn't afford video equipment at that time. And among the things that we had in our laps as we were observing was the accurate empathy scale developed by Truex and Karkov, Carl Rogers students and colleagues. How well is this counselor listening to the patient, interested in what they have to say, understanding it and reflecting it back well. So most of you, I assume, have had some training in, in client-centered counseling and know the skill I'm talking about. Now they're doing behavior therapy, and we were looking at that too, but we were looking at how well are they listening, really listening to the patient and reflecting back meaning. And uh, so we randomly assigned patients to the therapist, so there was no systematic bias there. And we all rated these therapists on the level of empathy. And our, our uh, ratings had very high agreement, 0.89 uh, among the three of us with independent ratings. Well, you see nine yellow bars, and those are the nine therapists and their success rates in working with patients. And they're lined up from one to nine, one being the most empathic therapist. We all agreed that was the most empathic therapist that we saw out of nine. And at the other end, number nine well, was the least empathic therapist. Two of us rated that person nine, and the other rated that person eight out of nine, so we had very high agreement. And you can see that the outcomes are rather different, and it's, they're not randomly distributed here. Therapists with high levels of empathy have 175% positive outcomes, and it drops down to 25% uh, in the, with therapists who had the lowest level of empathy. Who went to medical school, by the way? <laughs> now, over on the right-hand side of the graph, you see a red bar that is the success rate of people working on their own with a self-help manual, because we sent people home with a book also. And 60% of them hit this criterion for a good outcome. If you average all the therapists together, 
their average outcome is 61%. So therapists and manuals, self-help manuals are no different from each other. And yet you only have to look at the graph to know that therapists are different from self-help manuals. There are five of them where they have a better success rate than just going home with the, with the self-help manual. And there are actually three therapists where the client would have been better off going home with a good book <laughs> than working with this counselor. And this is not an unusual finding in addiction treatment. There are often a small number of therapists with particularly poor outcomes uh, hanging out down at the bottom there. Well, that's pretty interesting. And, and not only do we know there are differences among therapists, but we can account for them by empathy. That a high level of skillfulness in what Carl Rogers taught as accurate empathy makes you a better behavior therapist. Hmm, it's kind of intriguing. In fact, the correlations were pretty high, if you know about correlations. We were able to predict the number of drinks per week that clients were having six months later with a correlation of 0.82. You square, you're accounting for two-thirds of the client's drinking by how well the counselor listened. At a year, correlation is still 0.71. Two years later, the correlation is still 0.51, accounting for a quarter of the variance in outcomes, which is huge in psychology, based on how well this behavior therapist was listening to their client and reflecting meaning back to them. We're not the only ones to find it. In a study published the next year, Steve Valley reported these relapse rates. So up in this graph is not good, all right? Relapse rates for clients assigned randomly to counselors in an alcoholism treatment program. And the red bars are counselors who were low in, in client-centered skills. The yellow bars are clients who had kind of medium client-centered skills. And the green bars are the, the therapists, uh, therapists, counselors, who had the highest level of client-centered skills. And you can see that the, the relapse ratio is anywhere from two to one to four to one different, depending on what counselor you got. If you got an empathic counselor, you're much better off than if you get a very low empathy counselor. Well, with that, I went off to Norway on my first sabbatical, and they, I, I worked at an alcoholism hospital, and they gave me a corner office that had been the barber shop. So they ran, they ran the barber out of there, and uh, I got this beautiful office on a lake in a fjord sitting there, uh, you know, looking out into the, uh, the Norwegian forest. And I was hired to lecture on the cognitive behavioral treatment of addictions, which I did. And the director of the clinic also said, would you be willing to meet with our psychologists? Most of them are pretty green. Most of them are just out of training. Uh, and they're working with kind of tough clients and just, you know, have a conversation maybe every other week or so and see what comes of it. I said, sure, I can do that. And so we began meeting, and what they wanted to do was to role play the clients they were seeing. Uh, in English, of course, because my Norwegian wasn't very good at that point, still isn't. Uh, and so they would role play in English the patients they were struggling with the most and essentially say, oh, okay, smart guy, show us what you would do with this. All right. and, and I would do my best to show what I've been doing in Milwaukee and, and since. And they would stop me often. Now, the way European psychologists are trained is very analytic, not psychoanalytic, but, but analytic thinking, very reflective, uh, kind of introspective. And they would stop and say, what are you thinking? at this point. Now, you, you asked the client a question. Now, you could have asked a lot of questions. Why did you ask that particular question? Or you reflected what the client said. But the client said a lot of things. How did you decide, how did you know to reflect that particular thing of all the things that the client had said? And when I was being trained in client-centered therapy, nobody told me which things to reflect. You know. But somebody had taught me, and my clients had taught me which things to reflect. You know? And so I began to verbalize some decision rules that I was using implicitly that I was not conscious of and that were embarrassingly different from the lectures I was giving in the next room. Right? <laughs> and I wrote them down in what Carl Rogers called a discussion paper just to kind of send around to some colleagues and say, what do you think about this? You know? And the, the basic concepts in it were it, it should be the person rather than the clinician who makes the arguments for change. 
And what you want to do is evoke the person's own concerns and their own motivations for change. They don't care why you think they should change, but hearing why they might want to change is important. Listen empathically. Use those client-centered empathic skills to really hear what the person's saying. If you meet resistance, don't push back against it. Don't confront it. You know, don't oppose it. We, we said then roll with resistance. Just kind of go with the, with the flow. Reflect it. You know, nothing complex. Nurture hope and optimism, because if you convince somebody they have a serious problem but there's nothing they can do about it, you haven't done them any favors. You know? So also nurture optimism that change is possible. And I was thinking of this as kind of priming the pump, as, as getting people ready for treatment. You know? And so that was the paper that I, that I wrote up and distributed to colleagues, one of whom, to my surprise, said I want to publish it in behavioral psychotherapy. And he was the editor of it. And I said, I, I just made it up. You know? <laughs> I mean, the only numbers are the page numbers. I mean, I don't, I don't have any data at all for this. And he said, just let me publish it. I think it's a good paper. So I said, OK, and, and cut it in half, he said, which editors always say. <laughs> and I did. And he published it. And I figured that's the last that I would hear of it. Yeah. But I did go home and began thinking, now, if we turn this into an intervention for people with drinking problems, what might that look like? And having worked with severely dependent uh, people, I thought, I'd, and I'd like to go further upstream. I'd like to find people before they get so severely impaired and do something with them. And maybe this is something that would work there. And so we designed something called the Drinker's Checkup. And the Drinker's Checkup was essentially a, a very low threshold enrollment thing. We put a, a notice in the newspaper that said, if, if, you, if you've ever wondered whether alcohol is harming you in any way, we have a free checkup that you can come in for. It's, it's not treatment. It's not a, this is not part of a treatment program. You'll get health information back, and what you do with that information is up to you. Well, we got a lot of calls, and most of these people had never been near a treatment center. Uh, but every last one of them had a drinking problem. Every last one of them, had, there were serious reasons for concern. We did a thorough assessment looking in particular for things that would be early signs of alcohol impairment. Uh, and then we saw them one time and gave them feedback about what we found in a motivational interviewing style um, and gave them a treatment referral list. Here are all the places you can go for treatment. And I figured people would go for treatment. The outcome was almost nobody went for treatment, but they had the gall to change their drinking <laughs> on their own without additional permission or treatment. And their drinking declined just as much as in the graphs that I showed you earlier, following a, a single checkup intervention. So while I was thinking this would push people through the door to treatment, I guess we forgot to tell them that, and, and they just went ahead and changed. You know? Well, then we began, we decided to compare counseling styles. And so we compared two different ways of giving that feedback. One of them was feedback in a kind of confrontive directive style. So if you tell the person, well, you're drinking more than 90% of the population, and the person said, well, that, I, that can't be. I mean, everybody I know drinks that much. And that can't be right. You might say, well, now how can you sit there and tell me that when you and I sat here and constructed your drinking, and here are the drinking norms for the culture, and I mean, take a look. It's right there in front of you, you know? which was sort of common addiction counseling procedure at that point. Or in a more motivational interviewing Rogerian style, well, I don't think it's that bad. So this really surprises you. It's not what you expected, a reflection. Hmm. All right. Well, without any further treatment, uh, the red group is the confrontive condition, and they're, they're drinking decreases some. The yellow group is the group also getting feedback randomly assigned in a motivational interviewing style, and you see it's a, a steeper decline. Uh, both of them maintain pretty well over time. And again, the waiting list control was very polite and waited for us. And then we did the checkup, and then their drinking went down. But again, with some splashback. I've seen this now in several studies, that if you make people wait for treatment, it doesn't seem to work as well as if you treat them when the window of opportunity is open. We found the same thing in a training study, too, by the way, a, a training of motivational interviewing uh, study, that when we train people immediately when they ask for it, they showed nice improvement. 
uh, didn't maintain as well if we made them wait for training later on. So waiting lists are not necessarily a good thing. In fact, they may be pernicious. No. Now besides the counselors doing what I told them to do, because the same counselors did both conditions, so I had to train them up so they could walk into the room, open an envelope, and it says confront, and you can do that, or it says reflect, and you can do that. But I knew from watching that some of them were pretty good at one style and not the other style. So I said, well, what did they actually do? Not what did, what did I just tell them to do, but what did they actually do? And there we found that one counseling behavior predicted client outcomes. It was confront. The more the counselor confronted, the more the clients drank. And it was a 0.59 correlation, pretty strong. We also found, by the way, that the more resistance behaviors we saw from the client, the worse their outcome was as well. But those resistance behaviors were under the control of the therapist. So if you counsel in a confrontive way that, that evokes a lot of resistance, you have bad outcomes, basically. That was what we were seeing in this particular study. We also took a look at uh, to what extent did we get change talk, that is the client arguing for change, giving us the motivations for change. And in, in the more directive condition, we get half as much change talk as in the more empathic condition where we're listening. So if you listen well to patients, they say more things about why they want to get better. And we looked at resistance, and we got half as much resistance in the empathic condition. And it is, we know from subsequent research, the ratio between change talk and resistance or, or counter change talk that predicts behavior change. So you've, you've got about a three to one ratio in the empathic condition, whereas on the directive side, you've got ambivalent clients, equal amounts of pro and con, basically. And it is an experimental product of the way in which they were counseled. So here we got pieces of a puzzle. We have brief conversations, brief interventions that make a difference. It definitely matters what the counselor does. So after, after studying this for so long, I'm very aware when I walk in a room, I need to pay attention to what I'm doing because what I say matters. I can't just sit here and chat, you know, because what I say matters. That empathy predicts client change, replicated numerous times. That confrontation undermines change. People are less likely to change if you confront them than if you leave them alone. And given a brief intervention, clients went ahead and changed on their own without further intervention. Hmm, interesting. So then I went off on another sabbatical, this time to Australia. And in the office next to mine was this South African bushman uh, who was at the time living in, uh, in Cardiff, Wales, but working in Australia. So he's a man of the world. You know? And his name was Steve Rolnick. And he said to me, Miller, you, you the guy who wrote that article on motivational interviewing? I said, you read it? Wow, <laughs> I'm impressed that somebody read it. And he said, well, re read it. No, I'm teaching motivational interviewing all up and down the UK. It has become a preferred treatment for addiction, and I don't even know if I'm doing it right. <laughs> There's just this one crummy little article, and you've you got to write, you write more about this. You know? <laughs> so I said, well, show me what you do. And, and the way he practiced had exactly the same heart and exactly the same dance and exactly the same rhythm and working with patients. I said, yes, that's it. Let's write a book together. And so we did. And the first edition of Motivational Interviewing came out in 1991, focused on addictions. By the time our second edition rolled around, it had already spread into so many other areas of, of healthcare and social services that it wasn't about addictions anymore. And the third edition just in 2013, again, quite a different book from the, uh, from the previous two. So where are we now? Well, the MI books have been translated into at least 22 languages. There are more than 200 randomized clinical trials of uh, motivational interviewing, including 10 multi-site trials. There are more than 1,500 publications directly about motivational interviewing, and something like 40,000 that in some way reference motivational interviewing. Across a lot of problem areas, there's evidence of this helping. So it's now being used in healthcare, mental health, addictions, correctional settings, 
more recently schools, dentistry. I, I can't keep track of the places this stuff keeps popping up. And it says there's something in common across these kinds of behavioral challenges that people bring. And ambivalence, which is kind of the heart of what you're working with in motivational living, is just human nature. I mean, it, it is who we are. Uh, and the particular problem area it, it isn't so specific as the phenomenon of ambivalence. You, I want to, I don't want to at the same time, and how you work with that. Uh, there are more than 3,000 trainers working in at least 47 languages that we know about. And whole states and whole nations are implementing motivational interviewing in a correctional system or in a mental health system or whatever. Uh, so I'm just astonished. I mean, this started with an article that I hadn't even planned to publish. Uh, and it has just taken off like a rocket. This is Google Scholar articles by year. And so you can see the plot starts off with nothing and slowly picks up and it follows the, uh, the dissemination of innovations curve heading for 40,000 articles now uh, in 2013. So what is it? Well, it, it's a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation for and commitment to change. That's the way we describe it now in the third edition. Uh, th that's what we call the elevator definition. If you're getting in an elevator and someone says, what's motivational interviewing, and you're getting off on the second floor, that's what you say. Yeah. Practitioners want to know, what do, why would I bother to learn this? How, would, how is this useful to me? And there we say, well, it's a person-centered counseling style for addressing the common problem of ambivalence about change. Do you ever have patients who are looking for change and yet seem to be ambivalent or reluctant about it? You know? uh, if so, it is the tool that might be useful to you. And Steve and I began teaching motivational interviewing. And about 1995, we began writing about the underlying spirit of motivational interviewing for a particular reason. We saw people using the techniques that we taught them, and we were dismayed. Uh, it, it just it didn't feel right. It didn't look right. It didn't seem to work. Using the techniques without what we now call the spirit just was missing something really important. And what we said is we're obviously missing something in our training. There's something that we're not covering because people are going away and trying techniques, but they don't get what we're trying to teach them. And so we began to write about the spirit of motivational interviewing that now has these components to it. Collaboration, it's a partnership. It's not, I'm an expert, I'm going to fix you. I'm a teacher, I'm going to teach you these things. I'm a doctor, I'm going to repair you. I mean, it's, it's two people having a conversation, companions on the journey, each with expertise. You have professional expertise. Your client has expertise. Nobody knows more about your client than the client does. And if what you want is behavior change to happen in their life, you've got to have their expertise involved. It's got to be a collaborative partnership kind of approach. Acceptance, uh, fairly profoundly uh, like Carl Rogers was talking about. So a non-judgmental approach, uh, a respect for what the person uh, believes and an interest in what they have to tell you, and a belief that they have wisdom in them you know, and want to be well. Evocation, instead of installing things that are missing, that was kind of my training in behavior therapy, what clients are missing a skill, and what you have to do is install that skill, and then they'll be better. You know? or, or clients are missing insight, you've got to install the insight, and then they'll be better. Or they have irrational thinking, and what you have to do is install rational thinking, and then they'll be better. So all of it is kind of, I have what you need, and I'm going to give it to you. Motivational interviewing says you have what you need, and together we're going to find it. You already have what you need, and together we're going to find it. And it's calling forth from the person their own wisdom, their own resources, their own ideas, their own motivations for change. And then finally, we added compassion. The, the primary reason for the conversation is the other person's welfare, because you can do the other three things and sell used cars. Those are, those are all interpersonal influence techniques uh, that once learned can be used in a whole variety of contexts. We're saying here the purpose is, is solely the other person's best interest. All right. We talk now about four fundamental processes. This is a whole new way of uh, talking about and teaching motivational interviewing. First, engaging, so often ignored. You begin by collecting facts. You know, 
What's intake? Intake collecting a whole lot of information. You know? Rogers said, that's no good to the client. They already know all that stuff. You know? yeah. <laughs> engaging so you have a working relationship. And that can be done fairly rapidly. We're not talking about 20 sessions of engagement. You can see it happen in minutes within an MI session. Focusing, getting clear where we're going, what are the goals of our work together. Then evoking the thing that is most unique, I think, to motivational interviewing, calling forth the person's own ideas and motivations for change, and then developing a plan once the person is to the point of being willing to move forward. So far, summarizing an amazingly large uh, database, MI training, we know, yields MI consistent changes in practice. And I'll talk a little, maybe, well, I'll certainly talk about that tomorrow some that we're learning better and better how to teach people to do this. And we've tried a variety of different training strategies. So we can increase MI consistent practice. MI consistent practice yields more change talk and less resistance during treatment sessions. Those things predict behavior change outcomes. Uh, and that seems to be true across quite a few different problem areas. So this is not just something for addictions. As I said, it's being used in many different areas. Average effect size is small to medium with a lot of variability. So counselors seem to vary a lot in how well they do this and what outcomes they get. You see variability across studies also. Some studies find an effect, others don't. In a multi-site trial, with all the therapists trained together, MI works at some sites and not others. So there's something that we're missing that's important that varies across delivery, and I think we're getting hold of some of it, that accounts for some of this variability. What seems to matter? Therapeutic relationship. And my spirit and empathy, we know, are related to better outcomes, not just in motivational interviewing, in behavior therapy as well. The evoking of client change talk matters. We can predict from client change talk during a session how likely change is to happen from what the client's saying during the session. And what the client's saying during the session is a function of am I consistent practice. Also, decreasing client resistance is associated with change. And that's something that you see with a motivational interviewing session as well. A person may walk in very highly resistant, but it just kind of goes down over the course of the session. You're not responsible for the level of anger and resistance the client walks through the door with. But after that, it's up to you. And then the counselor refraining from counter-therapeutic behavior. So maybe some of what we teach people is just not to do the wrong stuff. Don't get in their face. Don't scream at them. You don't do that with most things in the DSM, you know, but somehow in addiction treatment that was good for them. You know, uh -uh, it's not. Don't try to persuade. Don't give uninvited advice. Those things all kind of increase the pushback and, and resistance. And so perhaps if you can just stop people from doing those kinds of things, you get better outcomes. And by the way, these things all matter in counseling more generally, not just in motivational interviewing. So in a way, we're getting at what get called common factors or general factors or nonspecific factors in counseling that matter besides the content of the therapist manual. Yeah. All right. We also, in the third edition, have said this is not just about behavior change. It's not just about stopping bad habits and not just about dealing with problems. Uh, motivational interviewing can be used in a much broader way that involves human potential and thereby it connects it back to the roots of motivational interviewing which is a humanistic counseling approach. The work of Carl Rogers and, um, and Abraham Maslow and Viktor Frankl and others who were important in the human potential movement. Well how could MI be used in developing human potential? I mean, first of all, I'm removing obstacles to growth, so I, I was worried the client-centered folks would, would hate me because we're sort of directional with MI. But in both the UK and the US, as I went to and talked to the uh, client-centered uh, communities, they said, well, no, of course. I mean, if a person's drinking and that's getting in the way of their personal growth, of course you would remove that obstacle. You know? That's not a problem. You know? We got over that long ago. So, yeah. Exploring personal values. What do you care about in life? What matters to you? Reducing self-ideal discrepancy. This, Rogers thought this was a source of pathology, that, that the more your ideal self and your actual self are different, the more unhappy and pathological you're going to be. 
And of course, you can do that by changing your goals, or you can do that by changing your behavior, and maybe some of both. By, you, you see now a lot of emphasis in third generation behavior therapies on acceptance, accepting things you can't change, familiar in 12-step community as well. Hobart Maurer, a learning theorist, wrote about integrity therapy, living in a way that has integrity with your core values. What do you care most about, and in what way is your life reflecting that or not reflecting that? I think MI has tremendous potential there. There's an article on spiritual bypass of people trying to avoid dealing with emotional pain by talking about spiritual issues. And this comes from spiritual directors. They say, there's something else going on here and the person doesn't want to deal with it. So again, helping people get around obstacles to their growth. Coming to peace with life transitions. Acceptance of one's limitations in aging. Acceptance of dying process, both in the person who's dying and then the people around them. There's a relatively recent study on evoking death talk, having people talk about the dying process while it's happening uh, as a therapeutic process. And the next step in life's journey, whether it's moral growth, thinking about Kohlberg's model, what's, if, you would, if you were to take the next step in moral development, what would that look like? In compassion, as described by the Dalai Lama and Karen Armstrong. In developing your faith, your spirituality, as described by James Fowler. In awareness, as described by the Buddha in consciousness. You know, so there are these kind of maps for human growth, and none of us are at the end of those. You know, so what's the next step for me in my spiritual journey, and how might I take that, and why do I want to take that? So we're thinking more about how MI can be used in other ways. Now to shift gears here, I'm going to talk about another line of research that seemed to me unrelated. I was interested in rapid changes that people experience in a matter of hours that seem to be permanent. Our, our model for these in fiction is Ebenezer Scrooge. Or It's a Wonderful Life, uh, the, the Jimmy Stewart character there, where both of them have a really out of the ordinary experience you know, that changes them, we presume, permanently and suddenly and dramatically, I mean, different in personality. And I've, I've loved those stories. I mean, they, a Christmas Carol just has so much in it. It's beautiful. But does that happen in real life? Well, it turns up in biography all the time. Spiritual leaders, very often in spiritual leaders, there's been a turning moment, uh, a, a moment of epiphany or, or something that happened that was just a, a change the direction of their life. And it, it's there very frequently, all the way back to Moses and the Buddha. And also social reformers, including Jane Addams. You find in, in their biographies these moments of, of change where something happened, mysterious in a way, often, uh, and they really move ahead in a whole different direction. Bill W., founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, had a white light experience that for him was the turning point and the end of his drinking, suddenly the end of his drinking. Well, if they happen, and, and my question going into this study was, do these things really happen? I mean, is, is this something that actually occurs in everyday life? But if they do, why haven't we been interested in those in psychology? There wasn't even a term for it. And the last psychologist I could find who wrote about it was William James in Varieties of Religious Experience in 1902, a long time ago. Now, theologians write about it. James Loder has a book about transforming moments, but not, not in mainstream behavioral health. It's just sort of dismissed as a kind of strange phenomenon. Uh, one of my behavioral colleagues did publish a case report of a sudden dramatic transformation and, uh, and called it an exorcism. You know, it's like, I don't know how it happened, but here's the report. At least he was honest enough to report it. Yeah. Well, James said there are two kinds of change. There's the type one change that most of us have most of the time. Little gradual steps, small uh, you know, steps in the direction of a, a longer term change, two steps forward, one step back. I mean, you all know the, the variety. Call that the educational variety of change, successive approximations to something you're trying to do. It's gradual, it can take longer than you want, and you can be frustrated with how long it's taking to change. 
It's what we see in addiction treatment most of the time. And type two change, he said these things happen discreetly, uh, suddenly, and they're enduring changes, they're permanent. Uh, I mean, when these things happen, people are changed in a permanent kind of way, and it's sort of like shooting rapids that you just kind of suddenly are in a very different place than you were to begin with. And he gives uh, multiple examples of those in his book. Maslow talked about peak experiences, kind of picking up on this to some extent, that, that he said are very memorable. They usually have a, people remember them very clearly even a long time later. They have a discrete beginning. They, they kind of knew when something strange was happening to them, often profoundly emotional. They seem to come out of nowhere, he said, like Scrooge. Had you stopped Scrooge on the way home and said, would you like some psychotherapy? <laughs> he would have said, at best, no thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and these folks have little or no sense of doing it themselves, that this is not something I achieved. This is not something I was doing. This happened to me. It came from outside me in some sense. And they're profoundly benevolent, said Maslow as well. And he thought at first they only happen to people toward the end of life and when they're very mature, but then he began to meet young people that had just the same experience and revised his theory about that. Well, I got interested in how could you study this phenomenon if it exists? And we solicited storytellers through the Albuquerque Journal, uh, through the local newspaper, and just kind of described the uh, peak experience and some of the things that James uh, had talked about. And the story said, if, if you've had an experience like this, Dr. Miller would like to talk to you. We get 87 telephone calls in a week. Uh, it, it was phenomenal. No. 89, I'm sorry. Uh, we said, we would like to come in for two to three hours, and we're not going to pay you anything. You know? <laughs> we didn't want people making up stories for pay. You know? uh, and ultimately, 55 people came in. Uh, donated their time and completed a rather long assessment process that was both qualitative and quantitative. And on average, it had been 11 years since their experience. So some time had passed. Some of them were very recent. Some of them were quite remote. Average was 11 years ago. And most of them had told nobody about it or very, very few people. They had talked to one or two people who told them they were crazy and they decided it was better not to talk about it. And when they saw this described in the paper, they said, that's what happened to me. You mean this happens to other people too? That's amazing. You know? And they wanted to meet the other people this had happened to. Yeah. Well, as we studied their stories, their 55 transcripts, which I talk, took off to uh, the Oregon coast and sat and just absorbed them and read them and tried to understand what, what do these things have to tell me? It seemed like there were two kinds. There were people that had a kind of insight. Now, it, it wasn't well, I'll come back and tell you more about that. And there are people who seem to have a mystical experience, like, like uh, Bill W. did. Right. So the insightful type of quantum change happens suddenly. People say, it was not like I decided something. It was not like I came to a conclusion. This was shown to me. So the meaning of the word noetic. Uh, this was knowledge given to me. Uh, came from outside. It, it was an abrupt shift in the way they understood themselves or the world or reality. And the second they saw it, they knew it to be true. It had that power of, uh, of persuasiveness about it. All right. So let me read you one of these stories of the insightful type that we call taking the AA train. This is a, this is a person who had been in Alcoholics Anonymous for 13 years, was sponsoring other people and trying to help them get sober and was having some difficulty with sponsors and sponsees and not quite knowing what to do, and heard about this guy that taught the big book and thought, well, maybe I'll go talk to him and just see if I can learn something that would be useful to me in my sponsoring. And th these are, these are uh, person's actual words. He called me back and said, if you'd like me to take you through the first part of the book, and maybe what I can teach you in a few hours could help this person that you're working with, and you can pass it on. It ended up being five hours. It seemed like 20 minutes to me. He was so precise, intense, and exact in answering all my questions, and I was full of questions. I was supposed to leave the next day on a plane, but within that five hours of going over the Big Book experience, just a complete transformation of my understanding, not only of the AA program, but my view of the world, my whole outlook on life. I wasn't drinking coffee that day. 
but I felt highly energized. In fact, I just felt like if I drank coffee, I'd blow off the face of the earth. You know, I was already real hyped energy-wise. There was this adrenaline of my mind embracing and consuming the material that I'd been hungry, hungry for for such a long time. I was crying for joy. I really wanted to know this stuff. It was just like I knew it when I heard it. I recognized it. It was really exhilarating, extremely cheerfully happy that I'd finally found what I'd been looking for. I went away in kind of a stupor for the rest of that day. Uh, I proceeded to study the big book more, learn more, and be more effective as a recovering alcoholic. In fact, I became a recovering alcoholic, whereas before I was sober, but I had these emotional ups and downs, roller coasters, anger that was out of control, and just a whole lot of sick behavior. Now, I was completely blown out of the water. I saw there was absolutely nothing but doom ahead for me if I didn't do certain things that provided certainty and hope. I'd gone to this guy feeling like I had all these years of sobriety and I had all this experience and I'd worked with all these people and my little life was just great. I didn't think I needed anything to happen. I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't going because I was distraught or anything. I was just looking for some good ideas to help the people I was sponsoring. It's Scrooge going home. Not looking for anything in particular. That's really all I expected. I went there to look for solutions for other people, and what I found was a solution for myself. I was devastated, but it was a joyful kind of devastation because I saw the solution in the same moment that I saw the problem. In all my years of searching for solutions, I had studied lots of different faiths and religions, philosophies of the world, dabbled in the occult. I realized that this was the central truth that pulled together all the truths of all the great religions and philosophers. You know, there's so many denominations around and millions of people saying our way is the only way. Now I have that sense of unity above it all and what the world is really about. That made it even more powerful to me because I knew that this thread ran through everything else that was of value. In a matter of hours, whew, this happened to her. Hmm? Well, that's insightful. It's not mystical exactly. I mean, it has a lot of emotion energy with it, but not quite mystical. James did a beautiful job of describing mystical experience. Mystical experiences have been actually studied by psychologists uh, and are well understood, at least in terms of what they look like. You have a, if you have a mystical experience, you have a hard time talking about it. You can't quite put it into words. It just doesn't seem to translate very well into words. There is often that quality of being shown something, suddenly receiving knowledge. You know. They're transient, they don't last long. Mystical experiences have a kind of beginning and a, and a fading period, but they don't last for a long time. Person is passive, they don't feel like they're doing it. It's being like something being downloaded or, or happening to me that's not my doing. A sense of transcendence of, of uh, material reality. Person knows this is not ordinary experience that's happening to them. It's very distinctive. This theme of unity, of, be, of connectedness with all creation or all humanity is a very common realization, familiar in Buddhism, of course. A sense of awe, being impressed, you know, like, whoa, what am I in the presence of here? Wow. And again, profoundly positive, rather like what Maslow was talking about. Well, the epiphany type of quantum change has those characteristics. Now, not all mystical experiences change people for good. In fact, most do not. Mystical experiences are much more common than quantum change. Right? And not all quantum change has a mystical component, so they're, they're not the same thing. Um, but these mystical experiences had an immediate, profound, transforming effect. Uh, and people knew at the time that they had gone through a one-way door, and there was no going back so different from the experience of people that we treat in addiction who with white knuckles are trying not to relapse, not to fall back to old habits again. Bill W. knew he was done. He was finished drinking. And we saw that over and over and over again. As, as soon as it happened, I knew there was no going back to how I was before. Here's one of the most interesting experiences to me because it's from a friend of mine he and I used to exchange cassette tapes rather than writing letters to each other. 
And he was driving through the desert of Oregon, coming back from uh, doing a concert. He's a musician. And was driving across the desert and making a tape to me when one of these things happened to him. And he kept the tape running and literally sp speaks into the tape the immediate experience, which is transcribed here. This is just the briefest description of it. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this wave of spiritual electricity washed over me. My body and the car and the landscape and everything started turning into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And everything started disappearing, including myself. I didn't know if I was having a heart attack or what was happening. During those moments, everything, including myself and the car and the landscape, just turned into little dots of light. Fortunately, he pulled off the road. Yeah. A, a visual metaphor that captures something of what it looked like and felt like is the transporter in Star Trek, you know, where the person being beamed up is turned into little dots of light you know, and goes somewhere or, or nowhere. It was awesome, and it was terrifying, and it was peaceful. I pulled the car off of what was left of the highway, and what happened in the next few minutes changed my life. It was the annihilation of the self, which I had never heard about or read about, but now was experiencing. What I felt was the actual experience, not the thought, not a discussion about, but the actual experience of being one with everything else and with God. I felt myself dissolve into it, and it dissolved into me. It goes into quite a bit of detail about the, uh, about the experience. That is not a normal experience. I read those to a psychiatrist, and they say, this person needs to be in the hospital right now. And yet, these are some of the healthiest people I've ever met. Uh, but the experiences are strange. And if uh, you can imagine, if you begin describing this to your friend, then you go, really? OK. Yeah. And another of my favorite stories is called Something Like a Star. This is a fellow who was admitted to an uh, alcoholism treatment unit against his will. He had one of the interventions where this family gathered around, and they had a car with a motor running outside. and. Okay, all right, I'll go. A month-long program, 28-day program. Um, and he'd been there a week, and he saw what was happening to people in the later weeks, which included exploration of their childhood abuse, which I'm not sure is a good idea, but it, it was at least happening in this program. And he had been abused as a child and was terrified of, of that being opened up and didn't know what to do. Uh, didn't know how to handle it. And so it's Saturday, quiet in the program. Nothing happens till Monday. Saturday afternoon, facing the beginning of this Survivor's Week, the next Monday, I went to my room to read one of the books they gave us. I'm lying in my bed thinking about this and feeling very uncomfortable because I don't want to face it. I'd seen a little of the guided imagery stuff, and I thought maybe I could just pretend to take a little bit of God and put it within me because that first week when I was looking inside, all I could find inside myself was just blackness and coldness. Let's try this, I thought, see what happens. I set my book aside. I was alone in the room, and I closed my eyes, and I just thought, well, if God is real, how do I picture God? The thing that came to mind was just whiteness, a silvery whiteness everywhere, all around me, everywhere. So in my mind, I reached out. I actually did reach out my hand and tried to touch it just to take a little piece of it inside me. And when I touched it in my imagination and I turned my hand, there was something in my hand. It was like a blue-white star. And light was just shining out of it in rays in all directions. I took this little point of God, this infinitesimally tiny part of God, and I put it to my chest. As soon as I put it into my chest, Something took over my body. It was physical. I felt like something was blowing up inside me. I could feel my skin bulging outward. I started to gasp for breath. I felt an ecstasy that was, the only way I can describe it is that it was like a sexual climax, but there was nothing physical about it. It was better than a sexual climax, infinitely better. It was essentially a spiritual climax, and I was gasping for breath, and then I was grabbing the bed. This thing had a hold of me. I mean, something literally took over my body. It was very physical. I was not in control. Something was doing this to me, and I don't know how long it lasted, but probably about 10 seconds. It seemed like a long time. Then it left me. I just wept. I was stunned. I thought, what the hell was that? 
I mean, it was real. This wasn't just something in my imagination. Something literally grabbed me. Something touched me. At first, I was just saying, thank you, thank you, my God, thank you. And the very next thought was, why me? Why me, which was such a common theme among quantum changers. Why was I so lucky? Mm -hmm. And then the next one was, what do you want from me? I was just absolutely at a loss for why it was so intense. I was looking for some little thing to help me feel better about the next week. This was incredible, powerful, overwhelming, and I was just holding my chest. I could feel warmth like a glowing inside me. I could feel warmth and life inside me. It was like there was light inside me where there had been only darkness before. I lay there for about 10 minutes, just absolutely stunned. And then I said, I've got to record this. And I grabbed this notebook, which he carried in with him, and wrote it down. What happened? It was very hard to find words for it. A mystical quantum change experience that, that changed him for good. Well, what was going on before these things? We were interested in that. You know? For about half of the people, they were in some kind of crisis or trauma. They were at, at hitting a bottom. They were at the end of the rope, and the rope broke. You know, it was, it was a, a, in severe pain. One man was uh, a, a gymnast, and he was demonstrating a trick, and he fell and broke his neck and became paralyzed for the rest of his life. And it was at that moment that his quantum change happened, for which he was tremendously grateful. So sometimes there was trauma and great conflict. There was often a history of, of childhood trauma. There was sometimes a feeling of being trapped, like I can't get out. I don't, I don't know where to go with my life. I'm stuck. I'm, it's, I, I'm, it's hopeless. You know? It was sometimes aimless wandering. I don't know where I'm going. I'm kind of lost in life. You know? But then also, for almost half the people, it was just ordinary life. Nothing out of the ordinary was happening. It was Scrooge going home from work, you know. It was, it was uh, walking across the living room past the fireplace. It was uh, cleaning the toilet. It was sitting on the toilet, you know. And it, these were literally the situations in which these things happened to people. And nothing that suggested something was going to happen out of the ordinary. So it's not just trauma where these things happen as well. And a third of the time, people were praying. It was the most common behavior. And often they were praying for the first time in a very long time. That was Bill W.'s experience. He was really in a traumatic hitting bottom situation and said, OK, God, if you're there, this would be a good time. You know? That kind of prayer. What changed? What people told us when we asked it is everything changed. We had them unpack it a little bit, but, but that was the common response. Everything in my life changed. Emotions were lifted, tremendous fear or depression or anger about the past just suddenly lifted. Some people were released from destructive patterns, including addictions. Relationships deepened, became fewer. These folks couldn't tolerate superficial friendship any longer but they had a few very deep friends. You know. Spirituality, they were kind of blossoming spiritually. If you think of it in Maslow's terms of self-actualization, it's like they got a fast forward in that process. Their sense of self change, their trust of the future, these, these people felt profoundly safe. And some of them were going into very risky volunteer situations and felt profoundly safe in doing so. And values changed. We had people give us a description of their values with a card sort that Milton Rokic uh, originally developed. What, what were your values before this experience and what were your values after this experience? And there they are for the men. Before the experience, wealth, adventure, achievement, pleasure, being respected, family, fun, self-esteem, and so forth. Afterwards, spirituality, personal peace, family is still there, God's will, honesty, these are except for family, things that were at the bottom of the list before, the last has become first, and the first has become last. You know? What about the women? Women's highest values before, family, independence, career, fitting in, attractiveness. All right. Afterwards, growth, self-esteem, spirituality, happiness, generosity, 
And family's still there, but further down the tree, interestingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I realized that these people started from sexual stereotypes, and after their experience looked much more like each other, that their high priority values were very much the same for men and women after their experience. Well, we did a 10-year follow-up. Can we find these people 10 years later? And we found 41 of them out of the 55 that, uh, well, 41 were clearly quantum changers. So we, as we looked at the stories, there were some that, I don't know about that one, but of the 41 that were clearly quantum changers, there were six we didn't find, three had died, and two we found and they declined to be interviewed, and we don't know why. We, we couldn't pursue them further, but 30 people 73% did complete an interview again at 10 years. And what we found was it's now 20 years since their experience. They still remember it vividly, as they did before, as if it had happened recently, of sensory memories of it. Nobody described having gone back to their previous self. What they described instead was a, a, a persistence and, and a growth or an extension of the change that began with their quantum change experience. Some of them had had more quantum change experiences over the subsequent years, and very low distress, very low psychological symptoms, very low disturbance. These were not people who would be coming in for therapy. Um, as I said, they were some of the healthiest people I ever met. In fact, they seemed to kind of glow, which was interesting. Yeah. Their top values were the same as they had been 10 years before and their pre-quantum change values were still absent. God's will was an interesting item. If it was present, which was true for, for one-third of people, it was the highest value of all of them. Otherwise, it was absent. Well, I felt like I had to write a chapter on what happened, you know, what's going on. And my co-author and I proposed actually five different possible ways of explaining this. One of them is people reach a breaking point. Something has to give. I mean, they, they cannot continue the way they had before. There just needs to be a reorganization of some kind. Uh, Jim, Jim Loder writes about this in the, in the transforming moment, that, that the, the personality almost decompensates and reassembles in a different way. Well, that seems to fit some of our cases. Others, there was no apparent conflict at the time. Well, maybe unconsciously they had a deep discrepancy of some kind, and it just kind of came roaring to the surface in this. So they were in some kind of conflict they weren't aware of, but it got repaired. But, of course, that would be hard to demonstrate. I'll, I'll skip over Loder's quote here. Maybe it's personal maturation. Maybe, maybe this is, as Maslow said, this is something that's meant to happen to all of us. It doesn't, but, but maybe it's sort of a next step in human evolution. Maybe it's a, a kind of maturing that happens to some of us. Uh, Richard Rohr's book, Falling Upward, describes the tasks of the second half of life. And what he talks about are very much the very things that quantum changers are telling us about. Maybe it's something peculiar about this person. The, usually the first thing that psychologists say is, well, they're obviously psychotic or got a personality disorder or something. You know, but I sure didn't see it. Uh, I mean, certainly not afterwards. Some of what they were suffering with before their experience would probably meet DSM criteria. But there just wasn't a consistent disorder there. You know? And then the fifth thing is these people had an encounter with the ultimate, with with. God or a higher power or ultimate reality or however you think about this. And it was a genuine encounter with that. And, and many folks experienced it exactly that way. I thought I was done on the Oregon coast. And I was packing up. And then, then it hit me that there was actually one more chapter to write. And what struck me was that the things that had been revealed to people in their noetic moments were very similar, even though these people were about as different from each other as you can imagine. Socioeconomically, gender-wise, age-wise, personality-wise, all over the place. And yet, the thing that they saw that they knew to be true in the moment came up again and again and again. And so I said, Let, suppose these are messages trying to get through to humankind, and these people happen to be the recipients of them. What are those messages? 
First one certainly is that change is possible. Deep change is possible. Tomorrow doesn't have to be the same as yesterday. People have a tremendous potential for major change. Mm -hmm. They knew it because it happened to them. You know? There are different ways of knowing truth. I mean, rationality is a piece of knowing truth. Science is a piece of knowing truth. But there are other ways of discovering truth as well, beyond the senses. And when you see truth, you should not be imposing it on other people. That one kind of surprised me. Because the, these people were not out evangelizing. The, they were not out trying to convince other people of what they had seen. If someone talked to them about their experience, they were happy to share it. But they weren't out trying to persuade people because they knew it to be true. They didn't need to persuade anybody else. They knew it to be true. I'm not God. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. That I'm, you know, I'm not the center of the universe. I'm, you know, and, and I need to get over I, me, my, mind. You know, this, all this kind of self-centered stuff is not the way we're supposed to be. Material reality is only a small part of everything that is. Hmm. Possessions ought not possess us. Be careful about what you own because it will own you. And use your time taking care of it and, and protecting it and trying to keep it from being stolen and you know, all those kinds of things. Hmm. Everyone who encountered an other, and some of them gave it the name God, some of them had no, they had no religious background and no name for it, but they felt themselves in the presence of some awesome, in the old real sense of that word, some awesome presence. And every person, no matter their religious background, described that other in the same way, as profoundly loving, profoundly accepting. They experienced in that moment acceptance to their very depth, being loved completely as they are every person. That's the nature of the other that they encountered. And, and it, was, it was so profound they had trouble putting into words and it was an overwhelming experience. And that love is what we're meant to be. When you meet shortcomings, whether they're your own or other people's, the way to meet them is with forgiveness and compassion and acceptance, not judgment and punishment and such. All of us are profoundly linked. We're all part of the same reality. And all of life is a gift, an opportunity. So those were things that these people suddenly saw. Well, is there any connection between these two lines of research? Because to me, they started from different places. And, and yet, in some way that I have a little hard time verbalizing, they feel like they're flowing together or they're the same river in a way. So let me just speculate a little bit about that. And here's a case example <coughs> that I think is helpful. David Premack described this, and I think it was autobiographical. A man had gone to pick up his children at the library. Thunderstorm greeted him as he arrived there, and as he waited with his engine running, he searched his pockets, and there was a familiar problem, no cigarettes. Not in the glove compartment, not under the seat, not in his pockets, nowhere in the car. So he pulled away from the curb quickly to go buy a pack of cigarettes at the corner store. And he never smoked again. What happened? Fully dependent smoker. Mm -hmm. What caused him to quit? Glancing back at the library, he caught a glimpse of his children stepping out into the rain, but he continued around the corner, certain he could find a parking space, rush in, buy the cigarettes, and be back before the children got seriously wet. And he said, dear heaven, I'm a father who would leave his children standing in the rain to chase a drug. No. And that was it. That was it. Now, it's a behavior, smoking. That, that's a kind of dramatic example of the kind of thing we see in motivational interviewing. It, it, he wasn't, it, he wasn't uh, getting behavior therapy for his smoking. I mean, not, nothing like that happened. It was a moment of insight in a way, or shame, or however you want to describe it, the behavior of smoking was inconsistent with something that was much more important to him. Yeah. What was that underlying event? A decision? Well, kind of. He decided not to smoke. A shift in perception? Yeah, smoking had a whole new meaning for him all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. 
people talk about the difference between being a smoker who has quit and being a non-smoker. The latter is a different kind of identity. Certainly an emotional impact to it. Increased readiness to take a look at change. Yep, that's going on. Ambivalence getting resolved. Yep, what smoker isn't ambivalent about smoking? You know, um, but here suddenly it shifts. Some write about the, uh, the Baumeister writes about the crystallization of discontent, that this was sort of the last straw that, that caused the balance to tip. The best thing I can find that makes sense of this to me is Milton Rokic's theory of personality. That there, there are various levels to our experience. At the most peripheral, there are behaviors or feelings or thoughts in the moment. Right? And beneath those are a set of things we believe about the world. And beneath those, he said, are attitudes that we have about who we are and what the world is like. And beneath those, values, instrumental values about how to do things. And beneath those, terminal values, the things that you want to accomplish in your life. You know? Instrumental, the way you do it. Terminal, what you actually want and care about and desire in your life. And then a sort of mysterious self in the middle. He said, when something that's more peripheral comes in the conflict with something deeper, change happens. If it's a behavior that comes into conflict with something dear, which is what happened in the pre-MAC example, the behavior loses. But if you get conflict at the deepest level, it can spread out through the entire system. When I read that, I thought, this is, in a way, this is what we're seeing in quantum change. And if it is some sort of underlying change that triggers, uh, underlying shift that triggers change, it's not just that we're selectively reinforcing change talk in motivational interviewing. We know that matters, but there's something much more important going on that we don't understand as well so far. So what do they have in common? Well, they're both pretty brief without a whole lot of outside influence. They're both relatively discreet and happen fairly suddenly. I mean, we're talking about relatively brief conversations often, producing an enduring change, producing change that seems to last pretty well over time. Maybe these are the ends of a continuum. Maybe there's behavior change over here and then this sort of sweeping personality change over here and everything in between, just like Rokic's model. A benevolent presence, well, that's what we try to be as motivational interviewers someone who is doing what Rogers talked about, who is, uh, shows positive regard for the person, who cares about and listens to what they have to say, who is genuine and present with them. You know? And that kind of presence people experience in their quantum changes and said it changed them. You know? And acceptance was a key piece of it. The experience of discrepancy, something's not right here, hmm? sort of appears on both sides. And there's no coercion. People in quantum change have a clear sense of, of a choice. They go with it or not. In fact, in fact, we had one person who told us a story and decided not to go with it and was telling us how much he regretted that uh, 10 years later. But not a sense of being forced. It's still a sense of being there out of their own choice. So they feel alike to me. I don't know if they feel alike to you, but it feels like it's the same kind of thing happening, just at a much more profound level in quantum change. The editor wanted me to write one more chapter for this book, which is how you too can have a quantum change. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't feel to me like, like, this doesn't happen in therapy. You know, I mean, you dream about this happening in therapy. But uh, it's not something that we know how to do, and I'm not sure we ought to know how to do it. You know? Maybe it is a divine encounter. I don't know. But I don't know how to write that chapter, and, and so I didn't. Uh, and I think in spite of all we've learned and, and uh, been inspired by in this, we still are just starting to understand that depth of human potential for change. We just have a glimmer of it, just an idea of how much is possible for ourselves and for the clients we work with. Thanks very much.
much for that. Um, I think we have uh, about seven minutes for questions. So we have uh, microphones if you'd like to raise your hand. Yeah. Well, say a little bit uh, more about the, the image of the continuum. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I mean, so what Vasilik and others have written about deep change and kind of superficial change, and I think you can imagine change at any of those levels in Rokicha's model. Mostly what I do is behavior change. Mostly I'm working with people about drinking and smoking and things like that. These things, I mean, are profound sweeping reorganizations within the person. I don't know how to do that. You know. Do you know how to change an attitude? Well, actually, we have a little more w wisdom about that. Do we know how to change beliefs? Well, yeah, we do know something about things that change beliefs. Uh, and, and so the behavioral, the behavioral science helps us at the kind of outer rings. But there's this wonderful, interesting inner ring that, that we haven't even looked at for a century. You know? Uh, and uh, I mean, my question going into it was, does that really happen to real people? And I have no question at this point. That is a real phenomenon. I mean, it, it is there. I don't pretend to understand it. I'm inspired by it. I feel in a way like this is the most important work I've done in my career, even though it's almost nobody's heard about it. Uh, but there's something about it that just strikes me as, boy, that matters. You know? Thank you. Uh, you know, it does seem to dovetail very strongly with the idea that, um, you know, the change is coming from within the person you're dealing with. And this is just uh, the far end of a continuum of possibility mm -hmm. that maybe there are, you know, there are lesser examples, uh, just a oh, more, so. lesser degree yeah. in everybody's work with, with anybody. Yeah. Well, you, you can imagine experiences that change a value the person has, which is then going to affect some beliefs and attitudes and behaviors and feelings and so forth. And, and Rokic said the deeper in the level that changes, the more it emanates out through the rest of the system. Yeah. It's very, very like Paul von Selig's uh, writing about levels of change. Yeah. Relationship between psychedelic drugs and quantum change? You get mystical experiences, but not quantum change, I find. Um, so there, there, are, there are definitely studies with, with um, psychedelic-induced mystical experience, and they're just like what James described. Um, but I'm not aware of situations, there may be some, I'm not aware of situations where that produced a permanent, sudden change in personality that endured over time. But there, there probably are some, you know. Um. How, how are you to um, understand or wrap your head around quantum change if you don't, if one doesn't believe in, in God or, you know? Um, well, I'll give you four other both? options, you know, so you can, <laughs> you can pick one of those. And it doesn't, I mean, you don't have to use the concept of God to describe whatever reality the person's experiencing, but it is something outside material reality that they're experiencing. But, I mean, I, I have colleagues in, in, um, Neuroscience. Who say, well, this, this is a brain fart. And this is the, this is some epileptic uh, phenomenon or something like that that's going on. So you, you can always explain it away. You know? When you hear so many of these stories, and the content of them is so consistent, I mean, to me it was very moving and very persuasive. But I'm also a person of faith, so so to me it makes perfect sense to say this person had a contact with. Whatever that thing is that some of us call God, uh, and it changed them for good. Yeah, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Mystical experiences are more common, but again, I, I don't know if quantum changes are more common among uh, meditators. I, I can't think of any of the people that we interviewed who talked about being regular meditators. 
uh, or had any sense that something they did produced this. You know? uh, and I, I kind of think if you, if you practice religion or meditation so that you can have one of these, it's unlikely to happen, you know. It's, that's extrinsic religion, you know. So, so there are lots of, I mean, paradoxes. A lot of truth is about paradox. You know? it, is there any evidence that um, motivational interviewing is more effective when practiced or administered by authority figures, teachers, parents, judges, and the like? No. Um, I mean, doctors have good results with it. Nurses have good results with it. Counselors have had good results with it. I mean, your salary doesn't seem to drive efficacy with, with motivational interviewing. Um, it kind of makes sense that if you have both high prestige and am I going for, for you, you get a bigger effect. But I, don't, I couldn't think of any evidence for that. Let's have a quick, two quick questions. One is, was there any particular age range at which you found that people most commonly had a, a myst or mixed mystical type of quantum change? I think the youngest was like six. Uh, wow. Yeah, and quite a profound one, and, and well up into my senior range, you know, so, uh, yeah. so, all so there was not a particular age at which it seemed to happen, no. And after that happened, if you, that you, knowing that you stuck with the people, did they have, did they kind of st struggle with that or kind of have to, you know, kind of work to keep it up after they uh, keep up the changes or was it something that they experienced as just easy to maintain those yeah. character I'd, characteristics? I'd say more the latter. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so there wasn't any sense of I might lose it, I need to do this to keep it. And I mean, that urgency just was not there. Uh, and people approached it more with gratitude uh, and experienced a continued movement, uh, like following a river in a way, you know, uh, being in the river, but not having to make the river or, or push it in some way. Uh, oh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you. I have recently read a book called My Stroke of Insight of a neuroscientist who had a stroke yes. at the age of 37, and she talks a lot about the differences in the right and left hemispheres of the brain, and we're so left brain oriented in our society, and for her when that was taken out, the right brain, which was this sense of unity with the mm -hmm. universe and the peace and the acceptance, and she couldn't think linearly the way before initially, but she had this just overwhelming calmness sense. Uh, for her, it was this quantum change that happened through that, even though it was eight years to come back from the stroke. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if there's anything, do you think that there's anything in these specific instances that you've been researching of people who maybe their right brain, they, you know, like opened up to where their right brain now, they're functioning more out of that hemisphere, and this different sense of their values and all, I just, there was so much similarity from yeah, what yeah, I was remembering exactly. from the book and what you are saying. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I would love it if we could find somebody who's just about to have one of these and put them in a scanner, you know. <laughs> I mean, that would, <laughs> but that's very hard to do, you know. So you have to keep a lot of people in scanners for a real long time. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it, and I'm, I'm more a whole brain thinking kind of person anyhow. But, but it does, experiences that happen with stimulation of the right brain in some ways resemble these things, and it, I mean, as, as a person of faith, it makes sense to me that we're wired to be able to do this, you know, that, 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 would, that would be a natural part of, of, of how we're wired. You can use the very same data to explain it away and say it's just the brain malfunctioning or doing something strange. Yeah. You mentioned that people um, quit talking about these experiences after a few people didn't want to listen to them or thought they were crazy and that they were delighted to talk about it. Oh, yes. Did you facilitate or was there any um, interactive conversations among them? No, I didn't have permission to introduce them to each other. I mean, it, we thought about having a party, you know. <laughs> uh, and I'm kind of sorry we didn't, uh, but we didn't. Uh, so we, we did not introduce them to each other. But if you do a study like that, have a party. Yeah. Well, I want to 
want to thank you all for coming and to Dr. Miller for a wonderful talk.